I'm going to ask everyone listening, remove two frame, uh, two uh, claims from your vocabulary. Reverse racism, remove it. There's no such thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm not racist. I I'm going to actually ask for white people to just remove that claim. Hey there, human. With me, Rain Wilson. Hey, everybody. Uh, it's me, Rain Wilson. Welcome back to Hey There, Human. So nice to see you guys. I'm really excited about today's show. Robin D'Angelo is on the show. She's the author of White Fragility, which has been a number one bestseller for like two years now. Um, this has been a, a, a crucial and seminal book uh, discussing uh, you know, basically why white people have such a hard time talking about race, and why they get so prickly and defensive. I say they, me too, us too, us we whites, prickly and defensive and have issues really digging in and having those tough, difficult, uncomfortable conversations about race. It's hard. I, I love living in denial. I love living, living in my little elite Hollywood privileged tower of not really looking at race and not having to deal with it and uncomfortable emotions. I don't even like it. Like if someone gets testy at a Starbucks that their drink order is wrong. I'm like, oh, mom and dad are fighting. Oh, divorce trauma. I don't, I don't want to look at difficult and dangerous emotions. And so I pull away, uh, let alone stuff that bears the wounds and the trauma of over 400 years of oppression uh, in various ways. I want to say that one of the things that has really bummed me out in all of the kind of online debate going on, it's basically red states versus blue states and, you know, this, this, this great rift, this division between the urban and the rural and the Trump supporter and the non-Trump supporter and the all lives matter versus black lives matter, this, this giant rift that has been created. But the thing that bums me out about it is, and again, I'm not here to get into that specifically, but what bums me out about it is just the lack of compassion. Like people are dying in really grotesque ways. They have been for decades, for centuries really. And the least we can do no matter what your political affiliation is, just like slow down and have some deep, deep compassion in your heart for George Floyd, his family, Breonna Taylor, her family, countless African-American families that have undergone this kind of trauma at the hands of police and other institutions. And not just big traumas like murder, but like all the little traumas. And to take some time and learn humbly about that situation and to just feel for people. Now listen, I know a lot of you are thinking, well, hey, we need to do a hell of a lot more than just feel. But you know what, you can start with feeling. You know, any action starts with a motivation that comes from a feeling. So I'm talking about not just like an awe, like empathy, like awe, people are suffering more. It's more like I have a deep heart-based, soul-based compassion if I put myself in their shoes as what they could be going through and let that spur us to action. So let me bring on um, Robin D'Angelo. Hi. Hi, how are you Robin? Hey. Hi. Thank you so much for last minute uh, coming on our show. And I know you're the most sought after guest kind of going right now uh, for a lot of very good reasons. And I'm really uh, honored that you're on Hey There Human. So thank you for stopping by. Thank you for inviting me, Rain. Um, so I will admit I'm only about halfway through your book. <laughs> it's okay. And, but uh, I'm just loving it. And for me, and maybe this is part of my white fragility is it's so hard, it's hard to take in. So I'm kind of doing it in bite-sized pieces mm -hmm. and like pondering it a lot. 
Is that part of my white fragility or is that kind of nor is that standard human? Uh... No, 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 no. I am so <laughs> glad you're doing that. You you know, it, it's an emotional aspect to it that's very, very deep. And you were talking about a compassion. And on some level, I think white people have to ask ourselves, why are our hearts not breaking? What did it take to break our hearts? What did it take for us to see? And so I think it's really healthy to like let yourself feel it. Because if you don't, if you just keep reading and pushing through that, um, that just kind of protects the vulnerability and the humility that, that we really have to reach for. And white fragility is not sensitivity or vulnerability or humility. And even some defensiveness is a normal response to, you know, being called in on something. It's defensiveness that we don't work through. It's defensiveness that ends up functioning to excuse us from further engagement. I'm sure you've seen this before. Well, then forget it. I'm not going to say anything if I can't say anything right. That kind of defensiveness functions to protect you from any further growth or awareness, right? It's a kind of refusal to be stretched or expanded. So, yeah, yeah. take your time. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and thanks also for permission to kind of make mistakes because that's part of how I've felt in this last month. I just know I'm going to make mistakes. I'm going to just say the wrong thing. I'm going to blunder in certain ways. I'm kind of a blurter as a person. You know, as a as a privileged white male, I have blind spots. There's a lot more that I have than blind spots, but I've got some big blind spots about how people might interact with me or feel about me. So let's talk about that, you know, people making mistakes in conversations about race. You're asking me all the right questions. If you think I am articulate and clear about how racism functions, about white people's role in racism, it is from thousands and thousands of mistakes across 20 decades. I could not learn if I was not making mistakes. Uh, the key, of course, but there's a difference between careful and thoughtful. We don't want to be so careful that we're not authentic. I will never forget an interaction with a friend of mine who's black. And one day over lunch, she said to me, Robin, you're always talking over me and that's your racism. <laughs> and I was like, no, it's not. That's not my racism. I talk over everybody. You know, so if I if I talk over everybody, it can't be racism. And she had to work to get me to see. But when you when you do that to me, the impact is different in the same way that when you as a man talk over a woman, the impact is different because the history is different. So carefulness just has us looking um, tight and insincere and not very warm. But thoughtfulness is always considering what is my position in relation to the ship to this person. You know, mm -hmm. we bring our histories with us into that encounter. Yes, I'm Robin an individual. I'm also a white individual. Uh, and I have to also hold that the history that I bring across race is one of harm. The other piece about making mistakes is repair. I've had countless black friends say to me, we're not going to give up on you when you when your socialization surfaces, when the assumptions that have been kind of conditioned into you come out. Uh, we're not going to give up and abandon you. If we did that, we'd really be isolated and we need you in the struggle. What we're looking for in those moments when it does surface, as it inevitably will, is where can we go with you? Can we talk about it? Are you willing to um, learn from that mistake? Are you willing to repair and acknowledge the harm that was done from the mistake, whether you intended it or not? Can you let go of your intentions? Can you stop going on about how you didn't mean to do it and look at the fact that it still impacted me in a way that hurts me? Hmm. That's, and that comes from a very different premise. The, the premise that, the, that fuels defensiveness is only bad people could be racist. Only right. people who mean to do it could do it. And therefore, if you're telling me that I'm doing it, you have to have misunderstood me because it's just not possible for me to have mm -hmm. done that. Mm -hmm. When you when you realize it's it's really more like it's not possible for me not to have these blind spots. Um, it's liberating. It's liberating because mm. then you just you just stop defending and deflecting and denying. You start seeking to want to understand and change your blind spots.
there's two, two things I really want to talk to you. And I know you need to go at a certain point. Um, one is, uh, I love how you, and I don't think it's just you, but in the book, you, you talk about redefining the word racism. Obviously, we know the difference between prejudice and racism. Uh, some people are starting to learn that, that prejudice is something that can be felt by anyone and under any circumstance. And racism is prejudice taken to such a degree that it has infiltrated systems and institutions to oppress and hold people back. Um, so it's, but the idea of reframing and redefining what racist means, because people think in their heads, a lot of people, racist means I, I call a person of color a derogatory name and I spit at them and I feel hatred in my heart or contempt in my heart. That's what being a racist is. And that maybe that was a racist in 1890, but now we have to look at a more kind of subtle, variegated, multifaceted um, viewpoint of what being a racist is. Can you talk a little bit about that? I really appreciate that you articulated the difference between prejudice and racism, but I'm going to I'm going to reinforce that because it's foundational. Everyone has racial bias, right? Uh, Van Jones can have racist racial bias against me because I'm white and he doesn't even know me. But racism is what happens when you back my group's bias with legal authority, institutional mm. control. It's transformed so that it becomes the default. It becomes automatic. I get to go about my day and, mm. it, and and it is upheld just by virtue in some ways of me doing nothing about it. I'm going to ask everyone listening, remove two, frame, uh, two uh, claims from your vocabulary. Reverse racism, remove it. There's no such thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm not racist. I I'm going to actually ask for white people to just remove that claim. Mm -hmm. When I hear a white person say this, I think to myself, ooh, this person has no understanding, no critical thinking, no current education on this topic. So that, that's great. So if if I if I am removing the phrase from my life, I'm not racist because me, Rain Wilson, I try my utmost to feel love for people of every culture, background, reaching out to people of different skin colors, supporting various causes, etc. Mm -hmm. So I'm like. Mr. Progressive mm -hmm. Hollywood mm -hmm. elite douchebag, but <laughs> oh, no. uh, how do I um, how do I reframe that? If I'm taking away the phrase "I'm not racist," what do I replace that with? Thank you for asking that. Um, so, so first of all, because I'm sure there's people who are still reeling from, from the fact that I even said that. Virtually any act that you can identify as a white person that was racist, Amy Cooper in the park. The people who do those acts are going to say, I'm not racist. So it's yeah, just she because, said she said, I'm not racist. She, well, she called our, the cops on a guy bird watching. Our yeah. president says he's the least racist person you'll ever meet. It's meaningless. And it's not at all convincing to to black people when we say that. Um, and so it, it's more that it, we get back to changing the premise that there's no way you could have um, been exempt from the forces of racism. Um, they shape the way you see the world, the way you think about yourself, the, the what you expect as you move through the world, what you take for granted, who you're in relationship with, who you're not in relationship with. Um, so I suppose I would, I need to think about what I would replace it with, but I can tell you the question that, that most white people ask now is if they're racist, right? Am I racist? And the, the answer that most white people will give is no, I'm not racist. Mm -hmm. So then what further action is required from us if our answer is no, I'm not racist? Mm -hmm. Nothing. <laughs> Which, of course, in a right. racist society is racism. OK, when you change your question to how have I been shaped by racism and how is it coming out in my life and my work? It puts you on a completely different path, a lifelong path. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's that liberating kind of question. How? And then you start looking into how how it has shaped your life. And, you know, my book is lots of I have a book called What Does It Mean to Be White? There's lots of reflection questions that can help you uh, unpack that. Mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. We've got to start talking to each other as as insiders. We do understand this in a way that black people can't understand 
or don't have that insider piece and white people, we will never understand racism if we are not listening to black people and other peoples of color. So go and support their work. And and I will say, like I said at the top of this thing, like I get uncomfortable if someone's yelling at a Starbucks barista because they got the order wrong. Like I don't like contention and conflict. And uh, and so I hate having these discussions. I hate it. I, it I would rather. Well, didn't it? <laughs> I thought this was a great talk, but um, well, someone, you know, someone, someone just real quick. Someone said that the that that you have to have the discomfort to go through. Uh, to transformation, right? If we if we will grant the premise that this society is racist, that the bedrock of the society is racist in all kinds of ways, it reproduces racial inequality 24-7, which it does. You and I as white people move through a racist society every single day in racial comfort. I'm comfortable in a racist society. Wow, that's another deep thing to look at. So yeah. we are not going to get where we need to go from a place of uh, white comfort. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But but safety and comfort are two different things. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we got to get uncomfortable for sure. Thank you so much, Robin, for your time. Everyone, please check out her book, White Fragility. Everyone else in the world has. <laughs> get, on, get on the bandwagon. It was such a pleasure talking to you. I really appreciate yeah. your time. Thank you so much. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Wow, what a um, great conversation, fascinating perspectives. Please uh, check out her book. You know, one idea is to, uh, if you're buying White Fragility, Google black owned bookstores. This is one way we can put our economic dollars to work to support black owned, people of color owned bookstores and restaurants and um, uh, buy our stuff from there instead of Amazon. Spreading much love to you. Thank you for being human beings. I love you all, and uh, I will talk to you soon. Bye-bye.